So let's uh, let's get started. Cool. Yeah, um, one one kind of thing I just wanted to mention first of all, um, just acknowledgements where they're necessary. So I, I kind of started this uh, matrix root stuff uh, when I was doing my PhD here at Birmingham under uh, Professor Peter Bukovic. Um, so before, before this paper was actually finished and submitted, I kind of went to do my year of postdoc research at um, INRIA in Paris. Um, that's where the paper was actually submitted. Uh, but the revisions weren't made until I was back here at the University of Birmingham. So um, a lot of this stuff has been done under under both institutions. Cool. So now that's out the way, let's do a quick introduction. Um, if I can remember how to. Yep, there we go. Um, for the introduction, I just want to say a couple of brief comments about matrix functions in the classical linear algebra, because that's, that's essentially what this is. Um, this this kind of root function, square root, cube root function, whatever it is, it's essentially a matrix function. Um, what do matrix functions and what does matrix analysis really look like in the linear algebra? And what are those types of results we're hoping to kind of emulate here in the tropical world? Um, that's another point as well. So we're talking about max plus algebra today. Um, I'll often refer to it as tropical algebra as well, but they're both synonymous. Um, we'll do a couple of the standard uh, preliminaries. So some of these max plus definitions, notations, you've probably seen it all before if you've been to one of these talks. Um, what I want to focus on today is the two by two matrix results, because as you kind of see, um, if a two by two matrices, I've managed to do a full classification of what all these roots look like for all integer roots. Um, I was able to generalize some of these results to a special class of n by n matrices. So we'll briefly mention a couple of things at the end, but I want to focus on the two by two stuff today. Um, one thing we should mention now in the kind of realm between two by two and general n by n is that for n by n Boolean matrices, so much simpler matrices, this, this kind of problem is already considered to be um, either NP complete or NP hard, I can't remember. But the, the point is a general classification for n by n matrices it's probably beyond our reach. So doing it for two by two and then kind of creating this subclass of n by n is probably a good, as good as we can maybe hope for. Okay, so let's move on. So if you've ever done any kind of matrix analysis or matrix function, you probably never quite remember what it's called. Um, the essential idea is that if you have a matrix A and you want to compute a function on that matrix, ideally what you would like to do is convert A to a similar diagonal matrix because performing matrix functions on a diagonal matrix is very easy. It's essentially about applying that function to the diagonal elements and that's all you really need to do. Um, in general, however, a matrix A may not be um, similar to a diagonal matrix. Um, and the kind of process you would therefore go through is to find um, some eigenvectors and eigenvalues associated with that matrix A. You can kind of use that to convert to a Jordan form, which is a matrix, kind of block diagonal matrix, where each block is a Jordan block. And for a Jordan block, I've kind of denoted it as J lambda N, where lambda is this kind of eigenvalue that goes down the diagonal of the Jordan block, N is the size of that Jordan block. And essentially, computing matrix functions comes down to computing functions on Jordan blocks, computing a function on Jordan block looks like. You apply the function to the eigenvalue down the leading diagonal. Then on all these subsequent uh, super diagonals, you're going to kind of differentiate and uh, evaluate at that same input. OK, and um, one kind of very interesting matrix function in particular is kind of the root function. So be it square roots, cube roots, whatever. And one thing that kind of comes up when you do this kind of analysis in the linear algebra is that it's the spectral properties of the matrix A that kind of dictate how many solutions you have, how many of these kind of classical roots you actually have. So for example, um, given a matrix A, you might have M distinct uh, eigenvalues. So each one of those eigenvalues would correspond to a Jordan block. And then within each block, you have P choices for your P root, if you're looking at the P root problem. 
So you might be looking at the uh, cubed root problem. So within each Jordan block, you have three choices. You have three branches of the cube root if you're dealing in uh, complex numbers and complex vector spaces. Um, so if you have M Jordan blocks, P choices within each Jordan block for which branch you're going to take, then it kind of follows that you have P to the M different solutions to this problem. So each one of those kind of combinations leads you to a different cubed root or different P root in general. So it's really spectral properties. When I say spectral properties, I mean, M is kind of the number of distinct uh, kind of eigenvalues. Um, is there anything else on here I wanted to mention? So let me just have a quick read. Uh, as I say, I wrote this quite quickly. I don't really remember what I wrote. Um, yeah, so can, this this is the particular problem I want to focus on, the p-root problem. And can we try to generalize this idea to tropical matrices? So when I say tropical matrix in this kind of today, I'm just referring to finite square matrices, but we're, we're kind of operating with them in a max plus way. So we have uh, tropical addition, tropical multiplication. So can we classify integer roots and can we find a integer root? And if we can find one, can we find all of them? And can we kind of relate all of them with each other? Okay, so as I kind of mentioned before, I wanna focus on the two by two case. And I would like to draw a link between spectral properties and the number of solutions. So when I say spectral properties in the uh, tropical world, I'm really talking about the algebraic multiplicity of the maximum cycle mean. So that's a term I'm going to define shortly. Don't worry about that for now. But hopefully there again is this link. Okay, so let's uh, move on to, well, this, this is kind of stuff I've already mentioned. Um, I want to do a full classification in the two by two case. That's great, we'll talk about that today. But N by N, I want to generalize the ideas to kind of um, create this subclass of N by N matrices for which we can find roots. Um, I'll talk about this approximation thing very briefly at the end. Um, this is what I mentioned about in general, we expect this problem to be quite difficult for N by N matrices. Um, this connection, I'm not really going to talk about today, but you can see the full paper if, you were, if you're interested in that. Okay, so a couple of terminal, terminological things, if that's a word. Um, in tropical algebra, so max plus algebra is called max plus for a reason. Um, the plus in tropical algebra, this is the maximum in linear algebra. So three plus four is equal to four, simple enough. Um, the multiplication in tropical algebra, this is kind of linear addition. So three times four is now seven. In, in our world. And I'll point out as well, anything you see today will be written in this kind of tropical language. So um, if you see an equation that doesn't quite make sense to you, it's probably down to this kind of translation. Once this translation has happened, hopefully it does make sense. Um, this A inverse, this usually denotes a multiplicative inverse. So the multiplicative inverse in our world is kind of like the additive inverse in the linear world. So A inverse is minus A. Um, A to the power of K, that's a, a multiplied by A iteratively, K times. So in the linear world, this is A plus A plus A K times. So K A, that makes sense. Um, K the root of a number, um, similar thing to this, A to the power of one over K should be one over K times A in the linear world. So this makes sense as well. So if you're taking the square root of um, six in the tropical world, that would just be three, you're just halving the number. Um, this notation isn't used very often in the tropical world from what I've seen, but um, it makes one of the expressions in today's talk look a little bit nicer, I think. So A over B, you can think of this as the multiplicative kind of inverse. So A minus B instead of A plus B kind of makes sense. Cool. So hopefully that's all quite clear. Um, these are a few of the kind of concepts I'll use today. So we'll quickly go through these. These, these first two are essentially just saying how we add and multiply matrices together. Um, addition is done component wise, nothing more to say there. Multiplication is done exactly the same way. Um, we're gonna take the ith row from A, the jth column from B. We're gonna combine the corresponding elements together. Uh, multiplying those corresponding elements is actually adding them in the linear world, and we're taking the maximum overall kind of uh, results. 
Um, this is essentially done in the same way. Um, multiplication of a matrix by scalar is component wise, same as in the linear world. Um, I've got these three concepts now, the positive determinants, the negative determinants, and this uh, max algebraic permanent. Now, these three are kind of the same thing. We're essentially taking a permutation on the matrix. So a permutation on the set of uh, N elements. And we are tropically multiplying all of the elements in this permutation together from the matrix, which is essentially in the linear world, just adding them all together. So in this positive determinant, we're doing this for all um, even permutations. So I've got this sign of sigma equal to one. This is what I mean when I say an even permutation. So we're taking the largest even permutation. Uh, for this, we're taking the largest uh, odd permutation for the debt minus quantity. And then the max algebraic permanent is just the, which is a, whichever is biggest of these two things. Is the greatest permutation an even permutation or does it come from an odd permutation? And then finally, this D of A is actually quite an interesting quantity. Um, I've done it here as a tropical kind of quotient, which essentially means in the linear world, this positive determinant minus the negative determinant. So it's just the difference between them, essentially. Now, this actually is a quantity that can be written in a different way in two by two matrices, because if we're focusing on two by two matrices, then actually this positive determinant is just the sum of the leading diagonals. It's just this A11 plus A22. That's all the positive determinant is for a two by two matrix. The negative determinant was a determinant for odd permutations. This is just the sum of the off diagonal entries. So A12 plus A21 reads A11 plus A22 minus A12 minus A21. And it's actually a quantity that appears in game theory. Um, I won't go too much into that, but um, one paper I kind of wrote with Peter kind of focused on this link between uh, these kind of systems of tropical equations and game theory. And we kind of saw this quantity in that paper. Um, I'll link you to that if anybody's interested in seeing that. Um, but this this quantity doesn't, doesn't come out of nowhere. It does appear in different branches. And this is kind of like my shorthand I'm going to use to describe the difference between these two positive and negative determinants of a matrix A. Okay, and now this is something that um, I'm assuming none of you have seen before. Sergey might have seen something like this. Um, this at the moment might look very random indeed. So let's quickly explain where this is coming from. So I'm focusing again on two by two matrices and I've defined this thing, which I'll call negative M, I guess for want of a better kind of description. Now, one of the kind of well-known features of tropical algebra is that we don't have an additive inverse. So remember tropical addition is maximization. So if I have three plus four equals four, there's no way of kind of going back from that to get to the original three. It doesn't make sense to say four minus three in a kind of tropical addition sense. Um, but I have decided to use this kind of minus notation for this matrix. So why is that? We'll kind of see that more clearly a little bit later on. But essentially, I define this as being the original matrix M uh, multiplied component wise by this very strange looking matrix. Um, you may also know this is kind of like the uh, Hadamard product, so it's tropical Hadamard product. Um, so these entries in this matrix are essentially those D values that we were just discussing, those kind of difference between positive and negative determinants, uh, square rooted and then either negated or not negated. And doing this component wise of M. So essentially I'm taking a matrix M and I'm scaling the leading diagonal entries down by some amount and I'm scaling the off diagonal entries up by that same amount. Now at the moment that seems random. Why am I doing that? Um, we'll see soon exactly why. So what, what is so special about this matrix and how did I come to kind of discover this strange looking matrix? Um, it, and it has a couple of nice properties. So if the leading diagonals of our two by two matrix happen to be the same and I call it small uh, lowercase m, then we have this really nice property of this matrix as I've defined it. 
that its square is the same as the square of this original matrix. Now, um, I'll show you a quick proof of where this is coming from in a moment, but it does lead on to some nice other results. Um, because this is talking specifically about squares of matrices, but you could generalize this to even powers of matrices. So if I am given a matrix A, and I happen to know already a matrix M, whose 2K power is equal to A, so I know a kind of 2K root of A, then this matrix minus M is also going to be a 2K root. So here's the kind of line of reasoning. If I do minus M to the 2K, I can split these powers up like this. And I've kind of already said that minus M squared is equal to M squared. So I replace that and then the result kind of gives itself. Um, so it does have this very nice property, but again, why is this true? Why should minus M squared be equal to M squared? And where did this minus M even come from in the first place? Let's have a look at this. So yeah, this is just a quick proof that minus M squared equals M squared. Um, I won't go through this too much. This is more of an exercise. If you are familiar with kind of tropical matrix multiplication, if you're not, maybe it's an interesting exercise to do. Um, but essentially, if you plug in our definition of minus M and you square it, you get this. You can simplify it to this. And this happens to be exactly the same as what you get if you do your original matrix squared. So those kind of results follow now. We've got these, if we have a kind of even root of a matrix, we also have a second even root of that matrix, assuming, remember, that this original matrix is the same value on the leading diagonal. OK, so where can we go from there? Cool. So before I kind of come into exactly where those matrices came from, um, a couple of definitions we need to quickly go through. Um, if you are given a matrix, a square matrix A, there's always this thing called the associated weighted digraph, where edges on that digraph correspond to the kind of IJ entries in that matrix. Now, I kind of say here, these edges exist if and only if the corresponding entry in A is a real number. That's because generally in tropical algebra, we are allowed minus infinity as elements of our matrix. Um, today, I won't be looking at that, but in general, that is possible. So if your matrix is completely finite, this is a completely kind of connected weighted digraph. Um, but the point is the weight of any particular edge is the corresponding value from that matrix. And then you've got these kind of quantities here. So if you take some cycle within that digraph, you can define the weight of that cycle, which is essentially adding up the weights of the edges. You can define the geometric mean of that cycle, which is kind of the average weight of one of the edges in that cycle. So remember this tropical power of one over K is just dividing the weight by K. Um, this is meant to be P by the way. These are meant to correspond. But yeah, you're kind of taking the average weight of an edge in that cycle. And the maximum cycle mean is where you repeat this process for every possible cycle and say, which one gives you the greatest average kind of edge weight? And that's what this lambda A represents, the maximum cycle mean. Very important um, quantity in tropical algebra. OK, so how do we use that? And this, this is going to appear over and over in some of the formulas we're about to kind of show you. OK, so. Um, Algebraic eigenvalue, this other kind of concept, and it relates to this lambda of A we were just talking about. Um, given a matrix A, we have something called the characteristic max polynomial, which is where we take the max algebraic permanence of this thing. Um, you've probably seen something very similar to this in classical linear algebra, where you're looking for um, where you're looking for eigenvalues of a given matrix. Normally, you'd look at the determinant of A minus uh, lambda I, something like that. And that's going to help you find the eigenvalues of a linear matrix. Uh, so this is kind of like a um, correspondence with that. So we have this, ma uh, this max polynomial, this characteristic max polynomial. And that will have different um, eigenvalues associated with it. In fact, this, this polynomial is actually a piecewise linear function. And the, the eigenvalues are the kind of intersection points of those different uh, linear uh, kind of sections. And the greatest of all of those will always coincide with this lambda of A as we defined it before. So this maximum cycle meaning is 
the greatest star to break from Matrix. It's a nice problem. Um, because in that piecewise linear way of looking at this characteristic max polynomial, um, it's actually the change in gradient at one of those intersection points that tells us the multiplicity of that eigenvalue. And so we can look for the greatest eigenvalue, which is lambda of A, and we can look at the change in gradient at that point and decide, is that a um, change in gradient of one, in which case it's a single multiplicity or a simple eigenvalue, or is it a change in gradient of two, in which case it's a double eigenvalue or multiplicity two. Now this stuff is generally okay to do. Um, for two by two matrices, this is quite easy to do, but don't worry about how we do that. Just know we can do that. So we have this maximum cycle mean. It's always an eigenvalue and we know the multiplicity of it in the two by two case. Cool. And um, so in this paper, the kind of stuff I used quite heavily to actually get any of the results is a combination of some very intense case analysis and also this cyclicity theorem, which is very important. Um, so let's quickly mention what this theorem is before I mention what's at the top. The idea is that if you have a tropical matrix and you're going to iteratively take powers of it, eventually you start to get this kind of cy cycle pattern that um, B to the K plus C is the same as B to the K, but scaled by some constant amount. Um, kind of to the power of C. So you, you can kind of take a large matrix, kind of um, this kind of scalar. That's, that, that's the kind of idea. Um, so before we go on to show you the results, which we'll do next, I just want to mention this thing at the top, because one thing I found when doing this paper was that in many cases, you can have a two by two matrix that actually has infinitely many um, square roots, for example. Let's talk about square roots for a moment. Um, and when I say I found matrices with infinitely many square roots, what I mean is that the roots were essentially the same except in one component of the two by two matrix, um, there was a kind of supremum value for that component. And it actually didn't matter what value you had in that entry, as long as it did not exceed this kind of supremum value, it would, this matrix would act as a square root. So for example, um, you could have a matrix where the, the first diagonal entry, the one one entry, as long as it is less than or equal to three, then the matrix as a whole will act as a square root for some of the matrix. Now, what I decided to do in the paper was to say that matrices were essentially equivalent. If you have a matrix uh, B, which is a K root of a matrix A, and if, if in addition to that, you cannot find another matrix C, which is also a K root of A, but is greater than or equal to B, then we would call B a principal K root. So essentially, I'm taking a family of uh, square roots. And for each of those families, I'm taking the supremum over that family and saying that is kind of the representative for that family of square roots. That is going to be the principal square root. Now, in theory, um, it's possible to have two square roots which are not similar according to that equivalence relation. It's possible that you have two different square roots in which uh, the first square root is larger in one component, but smaller in a different component. And these two cannot be compared in such a way. And that's something we're going to see as well. That does that does happen. Um, but hopefully this idea is quite clear that um, sometimes there are two square roots which are essentially equivalent. Okay, so let's look at the next one. And yeah, this is where I'm going to start giving you some of the results rather than just going through all the horrible case analysis. I just want to show you some of the nice kind of pretty results that we're actually getting. And one thing I noticed that was kind of crucially important in the two by two case is the sign of this D of A value, whether or not our um, largest permutation was an even permutation or an odd permutation. Remember this quantity is positive if and only if the largest even permutation is larger than the largest odd permutation essentially. That was what this quantity D of A was measuring the difference between the two. And 
clear all the odd roots, odd root two by two matrices. Now I always break these up into two kind of subsections when D of A is positive and D of A is negative. So let's say it's positive. We have some K grace record to one. This is going to be our kind of just help us describe our roots. Then what I noticed in these cases is that lambda of A before, remember I said this is always an eigenvalue. In this particular case, it's always a simple eigenvalue, which means it has multiplicity one. And I also noticed that there is a unique principle 2K plus one root. So that is, there is a unique matrix B for which B to the 2K plus one is equal to A. Now, when I say unique, remember, I'm talking about unique up to this equivalence class. And you can see the paper for how I kind of uh, came up with this matrix. Um, but what's interesting about this is that the ij component of bij, the ij component of b, sorry, is essentially the same as it is in, in a, but it's scaled by some uh, constant. It's scaled by um, looking at the greatest value on the leading diagonals of A. So for example, the 1, 1 component of B would be looking at the maximum of A11 1, 1 and A11. 1, 1. So it's just the first kind of component of A and it's scaled by that. The 1, 2 component of B would look at the maximum of A11 1, 1 and A22. 2, 2. So this is now looking at the max trace of A. So these, these, these components of A are not scaled by always the same number. But what is interesting actually is what happens when A was actually a matrix where the leading diagonals were equal. What happens when A11 is equal to A22? Then this AII plus AJJ, this is always just A plus A. Define A as the largest of these. So this simplifies to this A. And now every component of A is scaled by the same number. And this a here is actually in this case, you can kind of see this in the paper, this A is actually just the maximum cycle mean. Um, if D of A is greater than equal to zero and the leading diagonals are the same, then the maximum cycle mean will just be the value of that leading diagonal. So we get this nice result that the 2K plus one root is just the original matrix scaled by this power of the maximum cycle mean, which is a nice, very simple uh, formula. So for example, if k was equal to 1, then this formula would correspond to cube roots. So we would take 2k, which is 2, 2k plus 1, which is 3. We would take the maximum cycle mean, multiply it by two th minus 2 thirds, and then scale and multiply that with a, and that's going to give us our cube root of a. And it's going to give us a unique principal cube root of a. Um, so essentially, yeah, if D of A is greater than zero, finding odd roots of a two by two matrix is very easy. We just follow this formula if the lean diagonals are different, this formula if they're the same. Um, what happens when D of A is um, negative? Then we kind of notice that there is a 2K plus one root if and only if the lean diagonals are the same. So if they're different now and D of A is negative, then they just don't exist odd roots. Um, again, lambda of A, the maximum cycle means a simple eigenvalue. So it's a multiplicity one and there is a unique principal root. So again, there's this corresponding between the multiplicity of the maximum cycle mean and the number of um, principal roots. So we'll see this a bit more clearly in a moment, but there's multiplicity one, one root up here as well. Multiplicity one, one root. Um, but again, it's a very similar formula. Now the in this case, the coefficient by which we're multiplying A has changed, but because D of A has changed, this square root now is actually D of A in this case as well. Uh, sorry, it's lambda of A, the maximum cycle mean. So again, we actually get the exact same formula. So the conclusion of combining these two things, if we have a two by two matrix, which the leading diagonals are the same, then all of the odd roots look like this maximum cycle mean to this power, scale and multiply with the original matrix. And it doesn't matter if you're looking at even roots or, or kind of odd roots, you get this exact same formula. So, so okay, so that's essentially what happens with the odd roots. Let's look at what happens with the even roots because that is where things get a little bit more interesting actually. Uh, so let's just change that. Uh, yep, there we go. 
OK, so again, I've split it up into two cases. What happens when this um, this D value is positive? What happens when it's negative? So when it's positive, then I've given B1 is always a 2K root. So B1 is pretty much exactly the same formula we saw before. Um, we take this kind of. Sorry, I think I lost the microphone there for one second. Uh, Sergey, can you just confirm you can still hear me OK? Yes, I can hear you now. I OK, yes, so I don't know. That's fine. Happened. That's fine. That's fine. You can continue. That's OK. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so when this D value is positive, we have this is always a 2K root. So this B1 to the power of 2K will equal A. So it's a very similar definition to before. Um, an interesting thing about this is if we look at the D value for this root, it's also positive or non-negative. Um, I'll come on in a moment to why that's kind of relevant. In this case, though, uh, when we're looking at even roots and we have this D of A is positive, one thing that's interesting is that this maximum cycle mean is a double eigenvalue if and only if the leading diagonal entries are equal. Now, if they are equal, um, our B1 has this form, this nice version of the formula again that we've seen before. But also, if they are equal, there is a second principal root, which is not equivalent to the first principal root. And the second principal root has this really ugly looking formula. We can still take this um, coefficient out as we did before. But now, instead of being multiplied by the matrix A, it's this really ugly matrix. And it kind of seemed to me that this should be related to the matrix A in some nice, in some nice way. Um, we'll talk about this matrix in a moment, but the point is, in this case, when we're looking at even roots, we're looking at positive D values. There are always two, exactly two principal roots. Assume the diagonal entries of A are the same, so we get these two roots. Um, another interesting case is what happens when we're looking for even roots, but but D is negative. I and mean, actually, that's another case where roots don't exist. And we're going to see in a, in a moment an analogy, or well, my kind of analogy, to kind of explain why that's happening. So let's have a quick look at this relationship between B1 and B2. Because this, this, for me, was one of the really interesting things from the paper. We found this subcase where actually there are two principal roots which aren't equivalent to each other. We've got this B1, which is this maximum cycle mean times the matrix. And we've got this B2 is the maximum cycle mean times this other strange looking matrix. And what I'll just kind of point out here is that if we take B2, which was this horrible definition, well, the ugly matrix, we can kind of write it as a Hadamard tropical product of A with this matrix. So I've kind of taken the components of A out and then I've just seen what my results were about left over. And I've done a component wise product with this uh, almost equally ugly looking matrix. Um, but these values in this matrix, they are quite special because they're actually the square roots of the D values of our matrix A, either negated or not. So these leading ones are the negative square roots of D of A. These off diagonal ones are the square roots of D of A. And this is actually how I ended up defining this matrix minus B1 because it kind of seemed to me by drawing analogy with the linear real numbers that if you have a positive number, so you have the number two, for example, and you wanted to take the square root of two, so you're taking an even root of a positive number, um, we kind of think of the square root of two as being root two, the positive root two. But in reality, there is nothing wrong with the answer negative root two. And negative root two and root two, how are they related? Well, they are kind of additive inverses of each other. So that was my kind of motivation for using this additive inverse notation for B1, because these are the two kind of um, even roots of this matrix A. And this is how they're related to each other. And that's why I defined minus B1 to be like this at the beginning. Um, if you look back at that definition at the beginning, you may look at it and say, well, actually, these shouldn't be A's inside this matrix. These should be B1's. But actually, you can show that this these two things are equivalent. So this does fit in with the definition that we saw at the beginning. 
roots, we have these two principal uh, even roots. And this essentially led me to kind of offer this natural definition for a K for root of a two by two matrix. Because essentially what we just showed through all those different cases is that a K, so I'm combining even and odd cases now, but essentially a K root of a matrix A exists if and only if this is a K root. So it, it kind of motivated me to think of this um, in that square root of two kind of analogy, it kind of motivated me to think of this matrix as being the positive root and that uh, minus B1 that we we're kind of looking at before. If I just go back one slide, it motivated me to look at this as being the negative kind of square root or even root. So yeah, so th this is where this kind of definition came from. Now, I, I think what I've got next is a couple of um, a couple of tables which are kind of drawing some analogies that I've noticed between this and what's happening in the linear kind of real numbers. Yeah, so let's let's just quickly look at this, and I think this is a really nice illustration of what's happening. Some nice patterns. So in these tables, I'm only looking at when the leading diagonal entries on A are the same. So A dash in in the paper, A dash refers to the smallest of the diagonal entries, and A refers to the largest. So this just means A has constant entries on the leading diagonal. I want to draw an analogy between these tropical two by two matrices and real numbers. T. And I actually drew an analogy between the sign of this D value and the sign of a classical linear number or a classical real number. Um, when D of A is greater or equal to zero, we notice that there is a unique odd root. And I kind of defined that in the previous slides. There is a unique odd root. And that odd root also has happens to have the property that its D value is greater than or equal to zero or non-negative. Now that's kind of analogous with what happens in the real numbers. If we take a non-negative real number, we imagine that, well, we, we know that there is a unique real number R satisfying this equation. There's a unique odd root. So there is a unique cube root of a positive number. So for example, if I take the number eight and I want to take the cube root, I know there is only one answer. The only answer is two, if I'm ignoring the complex numbers. And yeah, so I kind of drew this analogy. And this analogy does continue because um, if we're looking at even roots of a matrix A, again, I'm still looking at the case when D is greater than or equal to zero. There are two principal even roots. Um, one thing I noticed about the principal root as I defined the square root or the even root has D value non-negative. Now the D value of the negative root, um, so that B2 in that example from before is always non-positive. So that was another motivation for me to define, if I just go back, that was another motivation for me to think of this as kind of like the positive uh, root. Because it's consistent with this property that in the real numbers, if you take a positive number and you're looking for even roots, there should be two answers. So if you're looking for the the square root of four, there are two answers. There's two and there's, there's two and minus two. Um, you think of two as being the positive root and minus two as being the negative root. And this is the same kind of relationship going on. The D value stays the same for this root. It's still non-negative. So I think of this as the positive root and it becomes negative for this one. So I think of it as the negative root. And it's exactly the same thing that's happening here. The two K root of T should always be positive. And then there's always a negative kind of corresponding solution. Um, another thing I noticed in the paper was that these two principal roots actually do coincide if and only if D of A is equal to zero. And that analogy kind of carries over to the real numbers as well, because these two even roots are the same if and only if the original number T was equal to zero. So if you're looking for the square root of zero, you can kind of think of it as having two answers. There's positive zero and negative zero. That's kind of like what's happening here. So, the, the, so this is kind of a nice table explaining the kind of analogy when this D value is non-negative. Um, you can kind of see the corresponding thing when D is negative. So let's look at that. Um, again, I'm only looking at when the leading diagonals 
But again, if D is negative, this is kind of corresponding to a negative real number. Now, what do we know about negative real numbers? Well, um, they do have odd roots. So if I'm looking for the cubed root of negative eight, that does have a solution. Negative two is a solution to that. And there's always a unique solution to that in the real numbers. Now, that's exactly what happened in our in our kind of matrix case as well. Um, if I'm looking for a odd root of a kind of quote unquote negative matrix, then there is a unique root and the D value of that root is also negative. So it's like the odd roots of negative numbers are also negative numbers. Um, and we also know that if we have a negative number looking for even roots, they just don't exist. So we can't take a square root of minus eight or a square root of minus four without moving into the complex world. And that's exactly what we see here. If um, we have a, again, a matrix which D is negative, uh, we don't have even roots of that matrix. Okay, so this is just kind of a summary between those kind of, um, those parallels between these two things. And yeah, and it, a quick few words on the n by n case. This, all this stuff kind of prompted me to ask, well, we've managed to classify things in the two by two case. What would this look like for n by n? Um, so I decided, well, why not just extend the definition exactly? Um, given a matrix A, let's define this matrix. Uh, exactly the same definition as before. And let's hope that this is some kind of candidate for the kth root. And what, well, is it always a kth root? And if not, what properties need to be satisfied for it to be a kth root? And one thing I noticed, if you take an arbitrary n by n matrix A and you define this matrix B in this way, and then you uh, power it up, so you do B to the power of k, do you get the matrix A as an answer? And what I what we kind of find found out was that for a particular ij component in the matrix A, um, you get the right answer in that component if these conditions are satisfied. And I call these kind of like the root conditions for the entry ij. So it's kind of like looking at um, certain two by two sub matrices of the matrix A. If a certain collection of uh, two by two submatrices satisfy these properties, then yes, this definition will give you a k root. Um, but obviously, this I mean, this this could in theory be quite a restrictive condition on on A. Um, one thing we also show in the paper is that a way of kind of constructing these matrices A, so these k roots do exist, but it does lead to some other questions. Um, one question, for example. Um, well, in fact, we'll come on to the question in a moment, but this is kind of what I was saying that um, if we have these conditions satisfied for a certain IJ combination, then the kth power, or sorry, the IJ component in the kth power of B will be the thing we want it to be. So we just need this condition to be satisfied for all pairs IJ. Yeah, so if it is satisfied for all pairs, then b to the k equals eight. Now, this was a kind of interesting thing that I mentioned in the paper, but I haven't really explored any further. Because let's say, for example, we have a 10 by 10 matrix A. And for each ij pair, we have a set of root conditions. Um, so we have um, 10 squared, 100 uh, sets of root conditions. Let's say 99 of those sets of root conditions are satisfied. So that when we define b in this way and we raise it to whatever power we're looking at, it will be correct in 99 positions and it won't be correct in one position. Um, so it kind of led me to this idea that if we have a matrix A which satisfies root conditions in most places, then if we, defi if we define B in that way, it might serve as a decent approximation to a kth root of A. It won't be exact, but it kind of, it's close in some sense. Um, but this this does need more more kind of work to see if that's even a useful uh, idea. Um, so the, the main question for me really is, we managed to classify things in the two by two case and in the n by n case, um, I can say if my matrix satisfies these root conditions, then yes, I can, I can give you a kth root. Um, what I could not find and what I'd be interested to see if anybody could find is, I could not find a three by three matrix which did not satisfy all the root conditions, but a root did exist. So the question 
can they can a matrix have a root when it doesn't satisfy these root conditions so are there other other types of roots for larger matrices which i don't yet know about so that's a really interesting question for me um i suspect it's not well i don't know but is it is it the case that a root exists if and only if all these root conditions are satisfied or are there other types of roots that's something i'd really like to kind of explore a bit a bit further um and i think yeah that's probably all i wanted to say today i didn't want to go too much into the end by end stuff but yeah thank you for listening um i'll be happy to take your take your questions